Okay, so this is a review of nuclear chemistry in preparation for our exam. Let's start by reviewing um, stability. Uh, stability of isotopes is based on the ratio of neutrons to protons in the nucleus. Although most nuclei are stable, some are unstable and spontaneously decay, emitting radiation. Remember, we determine that stability by looking at the neutron to proton ratio. In elements 83 and less, our nucleus is going to be stable, unless, of course, we're dealing with an isotope of that element, which would mean that the neutron to proton ratio would be greater than 1 to 1 and therefore rendering it unstable. Only certain combinations of protons and neutrons are stable. So if the nuclide falls outside the belt of stability, which I've explained to you about, then they are considered radioactive and they will decay into another element. There are no stable isotopes of elements above the atomic number 83. Each radioactive isotope has a specific mode, decay mode, and half-life, which is listed on table N. The half-life will never change. It is always constant for a particular nuclide. So which radioisotope is a beta emitter? So here you would go to table N and you would look for the decay mode and hopefully you're doing that now and you would see that it is strontium. Anytime you need to pause so that you can try to answer a question before I give you the answer, feel free to do so. Alpha particles are emitted during the radioactive decay of so we'd look up all four of these, carbon-14, neon-19, calcium-37, and radon-222 in table N, and we'd find out that the radon-222 is indeed an alpha emitter. Remember, an alpha particle is the same as a helium nucleus. The half-life of a radioisotope is the amount of time it takes for one half of that nuclide to decay into a stable nuclide. So the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So after 5,730 years, one half the mass of our original sample would be left. After another 5,730 years, a quarter or half of that half would remain unchanged. Please remember the half-life of a radioactive nuclide cannot be changed. That 5730 cannot be changed. As a sample of the radioactive isotope 131 decays, what happens to its half-life? Well, I just told you that it remains the same. Determining how much of a radioactive isotope remains unchanged after a period of time. Usually you're given the half-life, or you can look up the half-life in table N, and you're given the amount of time that's elapsed. So if you know the amount of time that's elapsed and you know the half-life, you can certainly figure out the number of half-lives. Then you can use the arrow method and the mass that they gave you to either determine how much is left or what you originally started with. So in this example, how much of a 20-gram sample of I-131 remains unchanged after 24 days? They tell you the half-life period is 8 days, so 24 days is your total time, divided by the half-life, which is 8 days, tells us that 3 half-lives have gone by. So if we want to know how much is left, we were going to be taking our original mass and dividing it in half 3 times consecutively. So half of 20 is 10, half of 10 is 5, and half of 5 is 2.5. So 2.5 grams is left after 24 days and that remains unchanged. Remember each arrow equals one half-life. Exactly how much time must elapse before 16 grams of potassium 42 decays leaving 2 grams of the original sample? Well if you look up potassium 42 in table N you'll see that it has a half-life of 12.4 hours. So if I have 16 grams and that decays in half to 8 grams and that decays in half to 4 grams to 2. 
So they told us we were starting at 16. They wanted to know how much time it might take to get to 2. So this underwent 3 half-lives. If each half-life is 12.4 hours, then our total time would be 12.4 hours times 3. 12.4 hours times the three half-lives. So it would be choice three. A change in the nucleus of an atom that converts it from one element to another is called transmutation. This is very important. This can occur naturally meaning all by itself because you're starting with an unstable nucleus meaning your neutron to proton ratio is not one to one or it can be induced by the bombardment or as I said in my video slapping of the nucleus by a high energy particle causing it to change into something else what is the name of the process in which the nucleus of an atom of one element is changed into the nucleus of an atom of a different element well, we just said that was transmutation. This should be down here by the two. It's kind of in the middle. Which equation is an example of artificial transmutation? Well, that would be the first one because the first one is the only one that has a nuclear particle in it. None of these have nuclear particles in it. The other choices are chemical reactions, not nuclear. Spontaneous decay can involve the release of an alpha particle, beta particle, positron, and or gamma radiation from the nucleus of an unstable isotope. These emissions differ in mass, charge, and ionizing power, and penetrating power. The spontaneous decay of an atom is called transmutation, specifically natural transmutation. Table O can be used to help you remember what is the uh, notation when you're writing an equation for each nuclear particle. So when we're talking about alpha decay, we are going to use four two H E we write our equations beta particle 0 negative 1 e we very rarely will have an equation with gamma because it's got no mass no charge neutron proton is usually written as 1 1 p can be 1 1 h and positron emission those are the symbols for the particles that we use when we're writing decay equations Which product of a nuclear decay has mass but no charge? Has mass. Well, alpha particles are 4, 2 He. They have mass. Neutrons is 1 but no charge because they're neutral. Gamma has no mass or no charge. And beta has no mass but a negative 1 charge. So it has to have mass therefore it's going to be neutrons and that arrow should be down more the check mark down more toward the two let's talk about penetrating power alpha particles have the least penetrating power they can actually be blocked by a sheet of paper next is your beta particles they can pass through paper but are stopped by wood and gamma has the greatest penetrating power they go through paper and wood and can only be stopped by concrete. Which type of emission has the highest penetrating power? We just said it. It was gamma. Which type of radioactive emission has a positive charge and a weak penetrating power? Has a positive charge and a weak penetrating power. Well, the only one that has a positive charge is alpha because it's 4,2-He. Beta has a negative 1 charge, gamma has no charge, and neutron has no charge. 
Modes of radioactive decay. We have alpha decay, which is 4,2-HE. The mass is made up of two protons and two neutrons. Beta particle, B minus. It's when an electron is emitted from a nucleus. Positron particle. It's a positive electron. The mass of an electron, but with a positive charge. And gamma radiation. No mass, no charge. And it's stronger than x-rays. How do we f um, determine which way a particle will move in an electromagnetic field? Well, here's a field, and it's got two poles, negative and positive. Remember, opposites attract. So alpha particles, 4, 2, H, E, is our alpha particle. So it has a positive mass, positive charge, plus 2 here. So it's going to be attracted toward the negative electrode. Then you have your beta particles, which are 0, negative 1, E. That negative charge is going to be attracted toward the positive chart particle. And gamma, no mass, no charge, undeflected through the electric or magnetic field. Nuclear reactions include natural and artificial transmutation, fission, and fusion. Transmutation, as we said, is changing from one element into another. Fission division. Fission division, breaking of a very large atom into two smaller atoms. Fusion unite, combining small atoms into a larger atom. And the nuclear reactions take place within the nucleus of an atom. So here is fission division. We take a large atom, uranium-235, we're going to bombard it with a neutron. That causes it to break into smaller particles. Gamma rays are released in the process. These smaller particles can be different elements, just smaller elements. But more importantly is we release three neutrons. These three neutrons then go find three more uranium atoms to bombard, and each of those split, and each of those produce three neutrons. So now you've got nine neutrons, and they go find nine more uranium, so you create this chain reaction. Fusion, the joining of small atoms, it's usually deuterium and tritium, so isotopes of hydrogen that combine to produce helium nuclei and a neutron. Both fission and fusion create huge amount of energy by the process of, of converting some of their mass to energy, but fusion produces a whole lot more. So given the fusion reaction, what particles represented by the X? So you would simply solve for the equation, 2 plus 2 is 4, 1 plus 1 is 2, so it's our helium nuclei. Given this nuclear equation, what's represented by the x? Well, 239, 239, so the mass of x has to be 0, 93, 94, so this has to be a negative 1. So 0, negative 1 would be a beta particle. There are benefits and risks associated with fission and fusion. Benefits to making electricity with fission is that it takes a small amount of fuel to make a large amount of electricity. We don't have to depend on foreign oil, and we're not burning fossil fuels, so therefore we're not contributing to pollution. We're actually decreasing pollution, and it's very inexpensive. Some risks, though, associated with making electricity through nuclear fission is always a nuclear accident. It could be a nuclear explosion. What do we do with the waste products that may be radioactive? And because it produces a lot of energy, there's a lot of thermal pollution. Nuclear reactions can be represented by equations that include symbols, which represent atomic nuclei. They include the mass number and the atomic number, which is the charge subatomic particles with mass, number, and or charge, and then emissions such as gamma radiation or other nuclear particles. 
So in alpha decay, notice uranium-238, we have to look up the atomic number, which is 92. It says alpha decay, so I write 42He. This arrow serves as an equal sign so that the mass and charge on both sides are equal. So 238, if this mass is 4, then this mass has to be 234. 92, and this is 2, so this has to be 90. The sum of the helium atomic mass and charge along with the thorium should it be equivalent to the mass and charge of the uranium. So when plutonium decays into uranium-236, it releases an alpha particle. Beta minus decay is the same as an electron. So you've got thorium-238, its atomic number is 90, it releases an electron. The mass number is going to stay the same, but you'll notice that the atomic number increases by 1 because this is a negative charge. Therefore, in order for it to equal 90, it increases by 1. Positron, or beta plus decay. Beta plus decay, the mass remains the same and the atomic number decreases by 1. Here you have potassium 37, its atomic number is 19, it releases a positron. Therefore, the mass stays the same, but the atomic number has to go down because this is a positive 1, so this is argon. Here you see protactinium 230 undergoing positron emission, and it turns into thorium 230, which reaction represents natural decay. Natural is the same as spontaneous. It happens by itself. So that would be number three. Number four is not natural because you're bombarding a stable nucleus with a alpha particle. Therefore, this is artificial transmutation. And one and two aren't even nuclear reactions. Energy released in a nuclear reaction, fission or fusion, comes from the fractional amount of mass converted into energy. So nuclear changes convert matter into energy. So that's why we have that mass defect, because some of the mass is converted to energy. Therefore, our ending mass doesn't equal necessarily our initial mass, but we can't tell that by looking at the equation. The energy released is equal to the mass lost times the speed of light, which is c, and that is squared. A small amount of mass lost converts to a very large amount of energy. Energy released in nuclear reactions is much greater than that of chemical reactions. Fission is used in nuclear reactors and atomic bombs, and fusion is used in hydrogen bombs and energy that powers the sun. So both of these nuclear reactions produce energy. Fusion does produce a lot more energy than fission. Given this nuclear equation, state the type of nuclear reaction represented by the equation. Notice that a neutron is bombarding uranium-235. We're creating two smaller elements, and we're releasing three neutrons. So this is fission division. The sum of the masses of the products is slightly less than the sum of the masses of the reactants, and that is because mass is converted to energy, a very small amount of it. This process releases greater energy than an ordinary chemical reaction. Name another type of nuclear reaction that releases greater energy than a normal ordinary chemical reaction, and that would be fusion. Okay. There are inherent risks associated with radioactivity and the use of radioactive isotopes. Risk can include biological exposure, which means that you could alter your DNA, 
long-term storage and disposal so how can we safely store this stuff and nuclear accidents realize that exposure to high amounts of radiation can cause cancer mutations and even death state one possible advantage of using nuclear power instead of burning fossil fuels reduce pollution cost effective so those are all good one risk of nuclear power thermal pollution nuclear accident storage of nuclear waste if animals feed on plants that have taken up SR 90 the SR 90 can find its way into their bone structure SR 90 if you look on table N is radioisotope so one damage one danger to the animals, well, it could alter DNA, cause cancer, kill them, a bunch of things. Reduce air pollution, cheaper electricity, and, oh, not depend on foreign oil, I didn't mention that one. A risk, thermal pollution, disposing of nuclear waste. Uh, releasing radioactive materials into the environment. Radiation can cause cancer mutations or death. Residents around nuclear power plants worry about the health risks. They worry about radioactive material being re released into the environment, um, seeping into the groundwater supply, how the waste will be transported, where it will be disposed, and honestly attacked by terrorists because we make it very known where our nuclear power plants are. This is the Indian Point nuclear power plant that provides electricity for New York City and it's located in I believe the south shore of Long Island. Radioactive isotopes have many beneficial uses. They can be used in medicine and industrial chemistry, radioactive dating, tracing chemical and biological processes, industrial measurement, nuclear power, and detection and treatment of disease. Some that you should know, carbon-14, organic materials, so anything that was once living, fossils, uranium-238, geological formation, so rocks. We talked about these in the lesson 235, nuclear reactors, iodine-131, thyroid diseases, and cobalt-60, treatment of cancer. So which radioisotope is most commonly used in the radioactive dating of mains of organic materials, <clears throat> fossils? That would be carbon-14. Radiation therapy. Um, gamma rays kill cancer cells. Irradiating food. Ca gamma rays can kill bacteria in food. And radioactive tracers used in biological processes. These radioactive tracers usually have very short half-lives so they don't stay in the body very long. And a Geiger counter can be used to detect radiation given off by radioactive isotopes. Okay, that's it. That's your test review. I'll put some review questions up on Castle Learning and you have the hard copy, the paper test to practice with.